Right, brilliant. Thank you so much for being here. It's so lovely to see everyone. So make sure that you have pen and paper or the workbook. We're on page six today, but you won't need it necessarily yet. Or back of an envelope will do. It really doesn't matter. It's really nice to have you here. So let's start screen sharing. And welcome to part two. So I'm just going to recap part one for those who either can't remember, weren't here, or um, haven't yet watched the replay. So this workshop is for you if you feel like the one on the left and you want to be like the one on the right, because quite frankly, you're fed up of feeling like the person on the left and you don't want to give anything up. You don't really want to quit your business or your job or your standard of living but you really cannot cope with this constant attack on your energy and your attention and you just want to feel like yourself again in fact you want more than that because you still have other plans so yeah this you're in the right place if this is what you want instead or maybe you feel like the person on the left in this one and you'd rather be like the person on the right so this nightmarish overwhelm where it feels like you're just being bombarded all the time and you can't think straight we're really going to look at that in more detail today because I believe that's one of the biggest issues because as soon as the brain becomes overwhelmed we cannot work out what to do any kind of googling about stress or overwhelm and it's just even more overwhelming so yeah you're in the right place if you are sick of struggling when really having worked this hard you should be enjoying your life you should be you know why did we work why do we work this hard because we want freedom we want ease we want more fun we want fantastic experiences we want to feel safe we want financial security but we certainly don't want to be just about getting through our days just about you know crashing into the weekend or a holiday and not having the energy to enjoy our lives this is just all wrong it's, it feels like we've, it's just all been set up wrong and some people seem to cope with it better than others but the point is if you're here it's because you are secretly struggling and you've had enough and well done for you for being here because this is a vote for you so you are not alone it's not just you you're in the right place and there's just there's just nothing wrong with you at all and I, I hope I can show you what a bit more about that tonight so yes this is me um and the reason my podcast is called the overwhelm oh i missed an l out interesting let go of that perfectionism really important the overwhelm is optional podcast um which i'm passionate about because i believe that overwhelm is like the gateway drug to the disaster of, of losing yourself and just trying to cope with your life so making overwhelm optional for you is something I'm very passionate about. So if you haven't checked that out again, if you haven't checked that out yet, please do, because it's a free resource. There's at least one um, quite short, sometimes longer if it's an interview, but, you know, a reasonable size, hopefully inspirational um, episode for you each week. And I'm going to talk about overwhelm and how to make it optional for you today. So in part one, we looked at the problem which is sick of not being able to really enjoy our lives just sick of the struggle with overwhelm and exhaustion and never just like just get the getting through rather than the really enjoying and I put forward my case for my practice which I call neutral noticing because noticing how you are feeling in any given moment is very very powerful it gives you the information that is missing and when you do it neutrally, you get rid of all of the automatic um, activation of the problem solving part of the brain, the judgmental part of the mind that just attacks you with, well, you shouldn't have done that and you ought not to be able to do that. And if you were better at that, look at that person, they're coping better than you. So neutral noticing, it tends to reset the nervous system because you get out of the head into the body 
and it tends to activate the parasympathetic nervous state, the, the rest and digest state, which is really good for you to do that. You know, if you, if you did take me up on my one minute mark challenge, maybe you notice that, but maybe you didn't because it's not a stress relieving technique. It's far more powerful than that. So there might have been occasions when you did the one minute mark, if you tried it, and it just didn't feel great because you really noticed how tired you were or how stressed you were. So it's not designed to just get rid of things. It's designed to focus in on the information that's missing from making better decisions about how to move through the day, to live with more skill, but to do so in a neutral way, which gets rid of a lot of the habits that push us in the wrong direction, push us towards breaking ourselves, basically. So today we're going to take a real look at habits and beliefs. So I would argue that the habits that got you to this level of success have served you well until they didn't. So if we go back to school, when we're told, you know, work hard, revise to get exams, and then the next thing happens, the next, and this is like, there's always a hoop to jump through, isn't there in life? <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's the there's examinations at school and then there's sixth form or college or, you know, university or promotions or there's always something to be striving from. And those of us who are very good at, at setting goals, at dreaming big, we can get very, you know, we can be really, really good at that. And have that enviable ability to focus on our goals. I mean, those of us who have built businesses, built careers, that's not by accident. You know, there are some habits there that have served you well, that have got you the success you've got at the moment. But those habits are not serving you anymore. And I would argue that it's the very habits that get us to that success that are the, the same ones that start to break us because we just push. The ability to focus single-mindedly on our goals we push it too far by accident we don't realize because it's a sneaky thing overwhelm and exhaustion just creeps up on you because if you're a person who's used to achieving and used to coping and used to getting stuff done and used to you know doing like much more than other people if you're the go-to person to get stuff done and, and you've done well then you're used to being able to cope and it can come as a real shock when suddenly it's like I don't think I'm coping. Something's wrong. This is <laughs> this is not me. This just I don't recognize myself. So we're going to really take a look at this. And, and what I want you to do is really notice what resonates with you. So which are the which of the habits I mention um, are the ones that you kind of go, yeah, that's me, because it doesn't have to be all of them. The ones that, that are standing out for you most tonight, just look at those for now. And, and just a word of warning, we're not trying to force change here. I'm going back to the neutral noticing, we're just noticing completely neutrally. So if you notice that your, your mind goes to, yeah, you've got that habit, you're terrible, <laughs> catch that sneaky mind with its judgment because it's not helpful. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start to look at the beliefs behind the habits. And and not try and change them. Sorry, I've got a dog who wants to come in. I'll just get the dog. Come on. Sorry about that. So we're not trying to change anything. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't need to change as in, oh, this is wrong. I'd better correct it. We're doing the opposite of that. The noticing is very, very powerful. And if you let these ideas about having alternative habits and beliefs wash over you, then that it will continue my words will continue to resonate resonate with you and then you'll be able to let go of things because you'll start thinking oh maybe I don't have to think like that anymore so don't try hard just allow my ideas to resonate with you and see what's true for you and let go of what isn't so no pushing and striving for the next hour <laughs> if you can do that Okay, so please do have a pen and notepad or the workbook or even a back of an envelope because it's so helpful. And we always think, oh, I remember that because that really makes sense. And then we forget it. And it's such a shame. So do write down your aha moments and, and do share them in the chat if you want to. You don't have to. So by the end of this workshop, I want you to have had some moments where you've gone, wow, I've never seen it that way. Oh, Maybe I could let go of being so hard on myself. 
oh I didn't know I thought that oh yes so it's like like by the end I want you to have been able to so it's like I'm trying what I'm doing is turning the world upside down and saying what if what if we're wrong what if what if the way our culture set up doesn't work for us you know it might work for somebody else but it doesn't matter what if what if it doesn't work for you and that's okay and you're allowed to turn things upside down so this is your chance to throw everything up in the air a little bit now that can be destabilizing but it doesn't need to be so what we're doing is we're just see if you can allow your mind to to playfully mull over these different ways of looking at things and just see what comes out for you so we're going to start with the body because one of the biggest problems is that we don't tend to we don't really tend to view the body as very helpful so if you're if you've noticed that for example you get cross with your body when there's something wrong so for example and actually let's back it up not even something wrong so i think it starts with things like right i really need a pee <clears throat> but i'm not going to go because i just want to get this done or yeah i ought to have some lunch i'll get something in a minute and then you either miss lunch or you eat something not very nutritious, which you don't taste while doing something else. Or I really need to move because my back's killing me, but I just want to get this done. So if we back it up to the normal things like needing to pee, needing to rest, needing to move, um, needing to eat, etc., needing to gaze at something other than a screen, they're, they're just like basic needs of the body which we kind of see as inconvenient because we just want to get stuff done, right? And when we start out on our journey of, achieve, of high achievement, now you, this is difficult because when I say high achievement, most of my clients think, oh, I just, I haven't achieved that highly. But from where I am, they've achieved really highly. They, it's just not enough for them because they want more. So if I say the words high achievement and you, you get some sort of like insecurity, just let it go. You're here. <laughs> you're here you have a certain level of success that you want to keep you have achieved lots of things in your life and in order to do that you would have had to do some sort of serious focus and sacrifice now we are taught and obviously it's a socialization thing as well because you can't have everybody just getting up out of a classroom and peeing and eating and or out of a meeting and peeing and you know we're civilized humans so there we do need some constraint but when we artificially constrain our bodies and ignore our body's basic needs for sleep movement nourishing food connection is also a bodily need um gazing at beautiful things i would argue that that's the need of the eyes and the heart and, and everything but if we just go with the basic ones how often are you going through the day going not now body not now suck it up <laughs> and then what starts to happen is then you get so there, that's the basic needs being ignored and inconvenient and then you start to get inconvenient niggles like backache headache sore eyes um what else you know those like niggles like i have people who they suddenly start spraining things and they can't work out why really odd like it's almost like the body's kind of like falling to pieces you know like oh no now now what's wrong and if, if you notice that in yourself where there's this kind of impatience with your body like it's an inconvenient way to carry your mind around while you get stuff done well that's a habit there's a habit of ignoring or or treating your body as if it's too demanding so you might want to write that one down if this is resonating for you how often do you treat the basic needs of your body as inconvenient because you just need to get stuff done? Or turn that around. How often do you have a really good night's sleep? How often do you move? And I'm talking about movement rather than exercise because exercise tends to be a structured, booked in, scheduled thing, which is often quite harsh and which which isn't necessarily what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the body's need to move, like the spine needs to gently twist every day. You know, the neck really doesn't want to be staring in one direction at a screen or whatever you're doing. So how often are you 
going through your day going, no, that's really inconvenient. I can go without food, movement, peeing, water, the rest of it. So just notice what comes up for you and then notice the, notice what comes up for you neutrally. So what we're doing, we're neutrally noticing, which is what you did in the one minute mark if you took me up on my challenge. We're neutrally noticing your reaction to my words. So you can notice whether what I'm saying rings true for you and then you can notice the judgment that comes in on top of that. You can notice all of it. And then you can notice the judgment of the judgment. We can get really meta here. <laughs> and then you can let it go because it doesn't matter. Just notice. Allow yourself to notice. Yeah, that's where I am. So if we keep pushing the body, what's going to happen? It's going to start to break down because actually the body isn't an inconvenient way to carry our mind around. Your body is actually an incredible self-healing, self-regulating miracle, basically. It knows how much water to drink. But what do we do? Oh, apparently I should drink more water. So we Google how much water we ought to be drinking. And yet our body knows how much water it needs. But we've become so disconnected from listening to the need for water, which is called thirst. We've become so disconnected from it that we actually can buy bottles telling us how much water to drink. How crazy is that? So we are using the mind to override the body. Even when we think we're doing something good for the body, like, oh, the body needs more water, I'll buy a bottle. And this isn't a criticism if you've got one of those bottles. I'm just pointing out that we're so disconnected from ourselves. So using the mind to override the body is useful for socializing, for socialization, but it can cause real damage. And if you keep going, what happens? Your immune system breaks down, your stress levels stay high, which is bad for every system in the body. And then you can't sleep. And as we all know, we feel rubbish without sleep, but there's also <clears throat> lots of research on the value of sleep. You know, driving without adequate sleep is worse than drink driving. There's lots of things going on when we sleep. So we just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So if you notice this habit in yourself, you can see how much are you pushing yourself too hard and what is resulting for you? Because I would argue that the symptoms of exhaustion um, and all of those niggles, um, the immune system breaking down so you get, you get ill more often, the inability to switch off and regulate, the inability for the nervous system to just regulate itself is a, such a common thing. But we can do something about that but you have to notice it first. So maybe just jotting down to yourself, what are you doing? How are you treating your body? Are you treating it as an inconvenient way to carry your mind around? Or maybe you could start to have a deep respect for your body, noticing how it's always there for you, how it knows what it needs. And that all of those inconvenient signals, even the inconvenient tears that might give you away, but even the exhaustion, all of it, what if it was just useful information? So there's a belief there. There's a belief that the inconvenient niggles are a sign of weakness and, sorry, not the inconvenient, the niggles, the things that we label as there's something wrong with me in my body. You can believe that they're inconvenient or you can believe that they're useful signals, that it's just all just useful information. And linking that, though, all those habits of pushing on through, even when exhausted and not feeling great, that's the habits, lots of them, which ones are most true for you. The belief there is that it doesn't matter, that my body should be able to recover or not even thinking about it. And can you maybe start to Look at your body as the old friend it is and see it as something actually incredibly resilient, which has put up with masses of neglect for years while you achieved your goals. And that the signs it keeps sending to you that you keep batting away is inconvenient or that keep being added to your get better at list, get fitter, <laughs> you know, get fitter thinner, have more energy, solve all of these problems, go and make appointments everywhere. Maybe instead, 
can you turn that around into, ah, my body is amazing. I need to learn to listen to it more because the information is useful to help me get back to health and then go about achieving my goals and living my life with health and energy. So that's where the energy goes, just mistreating the body because we're not taught this stuff. We're not taught that the body is amazing. We're just not, we're just not, we're not taught that. And yet it is, it's incredible. It heals, you cut yourself, it heals. That's amazing. You're thirsty, you drink water, you're hungry. Your body knows what it needs to eat. And yet we stuff food into it without tasting it. And we wonder why our guts complain. So there's a lot there from just listening to the body. And you can do this all within the one minute mark because the one minute mark takes you out of your head for a break from your overwhelmed mind into the body. And when you learn to move your attention through the body with curiosity and kindness rather than with judgment and anxiety, what's wrong now, to, oh, that's an interesting sensation. You don't have to do anything about it because it's not all, it isn't always convenient. Sometimes we can't have lunch, but we, at the moment, but we can in general set our lives up to prioritise having lunch with time if it's important depends what's important it depends what impact it's having on you so that's the first thing is the body so i'll just give you a moment to jot down anything that resonated with you and then we're going to have a look at the mind so the human mind is really really good at problem solving and at saving your life because it's very 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 easily tripped into a high alert stress state which will save your life you will run or freeze or the other one what is it fight or, or fight yeah but mostly we just get into this panicky state which we don't always even notice and for some of us myself included can spend years most of the time in a chronic stress state which is not what the stress response is designed for and it's not serving us and it probably is worse at this point in history although if you look back there's always quotes about how this period in history is terrible um, but yes, at the moment, I think the speed of life is so fast and the amount of information coming at us makes it even harder. So the way the human mind works is that we don't, when we walk into a familiar room, we don't look around the room and construct the room. We don't see the room we, because it, takes, it would take too long. So that's not how the human eye works. So what happens instead is if we go into a familiar room, what we notice is if something is wrong. And if something's wrong, we're immediately alerted to it. And that means that we are always noticing something that's off. So we don't, if everything's lovely and splendid, we don't tend to notice it. So there's a cognitive bias to change, which we don't like because something's off. So we might need to go into a high alert state. But also the, we have a cognitive bias for negativity to keep us safe because we have to look for the dangers in the environment. That's how we've evolved. So your mind is really, really good at keeping you alive, but it's not so good at happiness. So if you want happiness, you have to learn this about your mind. You have to see the mind differently. And, and what do we do? We get really easily overwhelmed because I believe the human mind is easily overwhelmed because it's not, it's just hasn't evolved to process masses and masses of new information all the time. And we're literally bombarded by mainly negative stuff. So the news, marketing, you know, marketing tends to be very anxiety inducing, you know, this will solve a problem. You better watch out about this, you know, and the news is very, very negative. And we are constantly bombarded by negative information, negative images, lots of anxiety inducing information. And the mind just goes complete, gets overwhelmed very, very quickly. Even if we're not, you know, even if we're not just looking at the negative stuff, just the sheer quantity of information coming at us. 
So the mind doesn't thrive with all of this stuff bombarding it. And we get overwhelmed. And when we get overwhelmed, the prefrontal cortex goes offline, which means we can't really think clearly, which then means we don't make very good decisions. And it's supposed to go offline because if you were being a, if you were being threatened by a saber toothed tiger, you don't want the prefrontal cortex going, hmm, I wonder which way I should run. What you really want is no prefrontal cortex, no thinking, run, <laughs> literally run. That's why the prefrontal cortex get shut down to save your life the problem is in a normal day your prefrontal cortex is get, getting shut down when you really need to think clearly so if you're stuck thinking oh my god I just don't know what to do I can't think I've got brain fog I literally feel like I'm pushing my soft brain into concrete yeah because that's how your mind's evolved it hasn't evolved to cope with the way we've set our lives up and knowing that how does that change how you feel about your own symptoms of stress anxiety and overwhelm i would argue overwhelm is inevitable but as the title of my podcast says overwhelm is also optional and this is how to make it optional for you you need to take back control of your attention so if you look at this picture you know there's like information being bombarded into the mind and the attention is going out all over the place and then you can't think clearly if instead you say okay so I can't for me it's easier and also because I was trained this is from a zen master so this is the zen tradition instead of trying to control our thoughts we just go okay the mind that's what the mind does and with compassion and curiosity and kindness we can say oh the mind's a bit overwhelmed so I can move my attention elsewhere and that's exactly what's happening in the one minute mark, the neutral noticing practice. Just for a moment, take all of your awareness down to your feet and feel your feet on the ground. Immediately, your attention's out of that chronic, overwhelmed, painful state. And the more you do that, the more you get used to being able to move your attention out of the mind, taking a break from the overwhelm, not trying to control the thoughts, not trying to quieten the mind, just so you can you know you can notice all of the crazy stuff the loops of dooms the constant i need to get better at all of the whack a mold to do list and just choose not to look at it for a moment and take a break and as you do that the nervous system tends to reset because you're allowing it to so in the one minute mark it goes feel your feet on the ground so you're out of the mind into the feet but your attention is going to keep getting hijacked so you have to keep it's like a muscle you're practicing a skill keep pulling the attention back into the feet over and over again knowing that each time you do that you become more and more skillful at controlling your attention and then later you'll be able to control your attention with external um stimuli and then you can focus on what's really important to you and you can also focus on things that make you happy so there's lots going on but just starting with the one minute mark feel your feet on the ground the next bit allow your belly to soften not relax because i don't know about you but relax is a trigger word for me because people used to say relax to me used to drive me mad because i didn't i felt judged i felt like you're assuming that i'm stressed and when you tell me to relax i don't like it because right now i don't want to relax i just want to get this stuff done because if i do it now it's easy um so that's just me i i i have never responded well to the words relax or breathe or change your breathing deepen your breathing breathing and i'm a trained yoga teacher so i can teach breath work and i can do breath work but i found the most powerful thing is to just allow the breath allow the breath believe that your body knows how to breathe stop trying so hard as if there's something wrong with you there's nothing wrong with you your body knows how to breathe just allow the belly to soften if it wants to and if it doesn't that's okay and those words that's okay to me represent because i respect my body i trust my body i don't need my mind to control my body I just allow my body to do whatever it wants to do and the body will reset itself. And if it's not ready to relax, well, it's just not ready and that's okay. You can't force relaxation. You can't try to relax just like you can't try to go to sleep. So the mind, easily overwhelmed. It's not your fault. It's not a weakness. And 
getting out of your mind, taking a break from the busyness and just allowing the attention to go into the body can be really, really helpful for you. What else did I want to say on the mind? Yeah, do you believe your mind is good at decision making? At decision making. So it's an interesting thing, decision making, because we think that we were we are taught and brought up to believe that you make decisions rationally in the mind. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to use the heart. You know, you, we're taught that if we allow the heart to get, you know, don't let your emotions get involved in business. Don't you know, you can't use you can't trust the heart. The heart is a whimsical thing. You know, if you follow your heart, you'll end up barefoot and, pre and pregnant. You know, all of this, like following the heart is an irresponsible thing to do. Is that how you were raised? Because it's a very strong cultural thing, isn't it? That the rational brain is the way to go and the heart is trouble. And also the idea that the body, the gut reaction, no, that's a nonsense. That's a bit woo. No, you should always make decisions by making a, you know, pros and cons list. Use the rational mind. But actually, the, the mind's not always very good at making decisions. Well, if we, why? Because if you go back to what I said, the mind's easily overwhelmed and it's, it has a cognitive bias of negativity in order to look out for threats and save your life. Therefore, if you use the mind on its own, I'm not saying the mind's no good. I say use the body, heart and mind together. If you just use the mind, often it's going to act from fear. And fear is no place to make a decision from. It tends to shut down your options. And this is how we end up feeling like we're stuck in a tunnel because we feel like we are stuck between quit, which we can't do because we're not quitters, or keep going and risk burning out. And neither of those options is acceptable because they both involve the risk of losing everything we've worked so hard for. Now that, anytime you think you've only got two options, and both of them are crap, your mind is overwhelmed, you're making the decision from fear, it's probably not true, get out of your head. <laughs> your body and your heart have so much to weigh in with that can help you. And actually, there's some really interesting research on decision making that the biggest decisions are actually made in a split second and then we spend the next few hours or minutes or years sometimes justifying our decision. Think about when you bought your home. We make buying a home, which is a huge decision. You know, we step inside that house and we know like that. Meeting somebody, meeting a partner, same thing. It's not really a rational thing, is it? Okay, sometimes it doesn't work out. I'm not advocating only use the heart or only use the body. You know, if we only followed the body, we'd spend all day exercising, having fun, eating good food <laughs> and drinking tons of water, which is great. But we also want to get other stuff done. So when we when we use when we recognize that we, we tend to overuse the mind and that causes damage to the body. When we bring everything in together, we have the information we're missing. And that brings us to the heart. So the heart has an intelligence of its own and we're told not to follow it. We're told it's risky, but actually, how's that working out for you? How's your happiness levels? If you're pushing away what your heart wants, if your heart is desperate to take a break and just spend some time with the people you love or spend some time on your own or just get on the floor and play with your dog, you know, if your heart's longing for you to do something and yet rationally it seems like, no, couldn't do that, it's too risky, how's that working out for you? What if you could do all of it? What if you could have this really healthy body, a mind that you can focus because you can control your attention and you can stay connected to your heart? Because in your heart are the things that you really want. That's where you connect to your purpose, why you were on this journey of mass achievement anyway. Why are you? Why are you pushing yourself so hard? Well, I bet it's because you were promised that if you worked really hard, you'd have freedom. 
and choices that you wouldn't have otherwise. That you would be able to have experiences that you really want to have, like holidays. That you would have a nice things and a nice home. So we work this hard and we push away the signals from the body and damage our health. We shut down the feelings from the heart and damage our connection to our purpose, our ability to feel joy, our ability to love and connect to others because we're so overwhelmed that we're not really present with ourselves or those we love. We can't. Have you ever been in that situation where you're somebody close to you, a friend or your partner's talking to you and you can't hear them because of the noise in your mind or you're just too exhausted and overwhelmed? That's not, I bet that was not on your to-do list. That, it's not your to-do list. I bet that was not on your goal list. So you worked yourself so hard that you would damage your health and damage your relationships and damage your ability to be connected to yourself, to lose the part of yourself that wants to have fun, that wants to feel joy. No, of course not. That's why you're here. The reason you've worked so hard is you wanted more freedom, more joy, more ease, more love in your life more everything and you certainly wanted more fun and I would argue that the disconnection from the heart is one of the biggest problems because we are told it doesn't matter and it does matter it matters very much and when you start reconnecting to your heart which for my students and get your life back and my clients can be one of the hardest things because sometimes there's also a heaviness, a grief, a feeling of time lost because we've been overworking. But once we just sit, sit with our hearts and listen with curiosity, with kindness, with compassion, with love for ourselves, then we start to get back hopefulness and optimism and joy and our heart starts to fill again. So what about you? What's your belief around following your heart or listening to your heart? Does it sound bonkers? Does it sound foolish? Were you warned against it? Are you, are you remembering times when you followed your heart and it was a disaster and you got really hurt? So we're not talking about leading with the heart. We're not talking about leading with the body but we certainly want to turn around the idea that the mind should always be in charge, that the rational mind is the way to live, that if we do everything logically, we'll be okay. No, body, heart and mind together. Then you get more information, the information that you're missing to create the life that works for you. So this is what I mean by you need to change the how, not the what. So when we get stuck in that tunnel of, well, what am I going to do? I can't quit. But if I keep going, I'm going to burn myself out. What do I, what do I change? It's a really hard decision, right? You don't want to lose anything. So don't. Change the how. So the how is the habits of pushing against the body, of pushing on through when you're ill, when you need a break, when you need to eat of ignoring what your heart longs for, what would really make you happy today, what do you really want to do today, and bringing some playfulness and rebelliousness. If you crush that down to get stuff done, no wonder you can't switch off and have fun in the evening because you've disconnected from that playful, joyful part of yourself, the heart. So changing the how is just reconnecting. It's controlling the attention so we're not always stuck in overwhelm, always focus on problem solving, always focus on what might go wrong, because that's what the mind does really, really well to save your life, but not for happiness. So we can start to control the attention, noticing the good stuff, not just the worrying stuff. And then we also listen to the body. Now, when I'm saying listening to the body, you think, oh, but if I listen to the body, I'd have to change everything. No, just listening. That's it. Not always doing anything about it because you can't always do anything about it. But you can notice completely neutrally. And that's enough. I cannot tell you the difference it makes when you start noticing neutrally what's going on for you. When you start 
taking seriously the signals from your body and your heart. It changes the how, and as you change the how, magic happens because it starts to become about you. And this is ultimately about just working out what you need as a, a unique person, rather than comparing yourself to somebody else and finding that you ought to be better. There's nothing wrong with you. So coming right back to my central technique again, neutral noticing changes the how without you having to try to achieve anything at all. So you're not trying to do anything. You're not even trying to change the how. <laughs> you just notice completely neutrally. And whilst you're doing that, it tends to reduce your stress and overwhelm because you're moving your attention from your mind where the stress and overwhelm's living into the body, listening to the body, treating the body like this old friend that just wants to tell you some useful information about how to change how you move through your day so that you feel better. And connecting with the heart and daring, daring to commit to yourself and say, actually, I don't want to do that. I don't want to let anyone down, but that doesn't feel right for me. That doesn't make me happy. Oh, is making yourself happy selfish? And there's another belief. What do you think? Is making yourself happy selfish? Is putting yourself first selfish? If you're the kind of person who I work with, <laughs> then you don't like disappointing others. You would rather disappoint yourself than disappoint others. But in doing so, how much are you damaging your health and actually your relationships? Because in your need to not let another person down, you're letting yourself down. And I'm not advocating letting people down at all, but I am advocating that you don't let yourself down. That you have a duty to be happy, that life is about happiness, that committing to yourself first, looking after yourself, committing to your happiness, because you cannot make somebody else happy and they cannot make you happy. You get to decide how you live. You get to decide to be happy. And when you're happy, everybody around you feels that happiness and they're happier and we want the world to be a better place at least i know i do and all of the people i work with do big-hearted professionals and big-hearted entrepreneurs and they don't want to let anyone down and then what they find is when they commit to looking after themselves when they commit to listening to their needs changing their boundaries changing how they move through their day by setting things up for health and energy and focus and joy, happiness and more ease, then they become happier. They become easier to be around and the people around them are happier and that spreads out everywhere and the world gets happier. So it's not selfish. I would say it's the opposite of selfish. So I did show this one last time, but I just wanted to give you some hope here. I love this. I have more energy. I work with a feeling of purpose. I sleep better and I simply enjoy my life much more. But she adds, and I get more done. So this is not about giving up on your goals. This is about kicking ass on your goals, but with utter kindness to yourself really listening to what you need doing things your way it's actually an act of rebellion 